I'm Al Sachs. I'm on the Cider Day planning committee. We are so excited to have Claude Jolquer back again. Now, those of you who've been coming to Cider Days before, how many people have been to Cider Days before? Has everybody been before? Any no oh, Who hasn't been before? Okay. For you newbies, Claude, we always have him come and talk because he's always got something interesting to say. One of the things that, uh, if you don't know, he has written one of the best books on making cider. And I hope you all read and speak French because he has the French version here. And for the few of you who don't, speak French. He has the English version. And uh, I urge that, you know, you learn French so you can read it in the original, but, you know, for those of us who are... The English is better? No. It's better. It's the original. Oh, it's the original. Okay, so if you want to correct his French, you read the English and then go back and retranslate it. But anyhow, we're not here to talk about his book. If you want a copy, you can buy it later. Signature by the author, of course. Um, but uh, Claude's going to talk about his travels, uh, which I think many of us who are into old apples wished we could be on or want to go on. You know, it's on our bucket list. Well, he's done it. He's gone to Kazakhstan. And he is going to take us on the journey and... Um, I know you think like he may be a hip hop mogul with the way he's dressed, but this is really a traditional dress. So uh, I'm going to let him take it away, and uh, and uh, we want to thank you so much for being back with us. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And you are listening to Cider Chat, and this is episode 153. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Wynn Collar and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider tree from around the world. Bringing us into this week's chat was Al Sachs, who is on the Franklin County Cider Days Committee. He was introducing Claude Jacquelet, who will be our featured guest on this week's podcast. As Claude brings us through his presentation on the journey to find the giant apple tree in Kazakhstan. There's going to be more on that chat shortly, but first, we always go to a bit of news out and about in Ciderville. There is no surprise that this time of year we are just steeped into the apple bin and rolling around in apple love all over the place. And Last week, I just got to catch you up. I have just been nonstop uh, with a glass in my hand. <laughs> it's a little bit crazy on that end. Oh, so many people I've met over the past couple of days. Uh, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to get this episode out. So I took the easy route out and, and putting this uh, pretty straightforward editing with Claude to you this week because I, I just can't, I, I need a little bit of rest, a little bit of sleep. But let me catch you up. Last week, I had the New England Cider Tour, which was absolutely perfect. We saw Farnham Hill. We hung out with Steve Wood. We got to go into his back cidery where he was just kind of leaning against the tank, just opening each tap, letting folks taste things and get an idea of where they're going there. Uh, brought out one of the coveted still dry ciders that they had. We did some growler fills, uh, took a tour in the apple storage bin where he just kept on grabbing out each apple and letting, letting us taste the different variety there. I did record that. Uh, I'll see as I could roll, uh, maybe little snippets of that. Then we had lunch, a uh, lovely time there, and then headed up the mountainside to Flag Hill Farm which was not originally on the tour, but we did it. And uh, wow, what an amazing experience. It was. I was just ecstatic to see Sebastian, mainly to also show the, the cider travelers what a fully off-the-grid scene could look like and how it's just so darn special. It was a rainy day. It was kind of a little slippery out. Even getting up there on the dirt road, we were going pretty slow because it, it was, you know, you're up way up on Flag Hill. And if I didn't have written directions from Sebastian, uh, I had my GPS going at the same time, but if I didn't have written directions, we would not have found it. So that just tells you something. Uh, at the same time, he was also distilling, so we got to see that. 
and uh, brought a bunch of ciders home from there, too. Then we made our way down to Fable Farm Firmatory and hung out with Christopher and John Piana, who are the cider makers there. They're the two brothers at this, essentially, it's like a land trust, farm trust, big old barn that was moved from New Hampshire to Vermont and all tricked out. And in the bottom of this barn is a hundred foot long cider cellar, uh, concave ceiling, insane. And outside of there is a tasting room. And most folks going there, I presume they're not really going into the cellar. I think you have to kind of watch out bringing lots of people in because that's a lot of people going into your cellar and it's, I don't know, I'm not sure what they're doing. But anyways, we did get a tour in there, got a tasting right out of the barrel. Uh, we're in the tasting room where we then had our cider dinner with a f- roaring fire in the background. Chef Joseph, all the people there, gaga. I just tell you what, it was absolutely gaga for me. And um, Jennifer from Eden Cider was there. We were, so we had on the table four ciders for a complement of like four ciders. I don't know, maybe some more ciders. I can't remember now. But Fable Farm, Eden, Tin Hat, and they're all this like, kind of wild, exquisite, perfectly paired with this hearth roasted chicken that had this rather spicy rub to it. But when you sip that cider and tasted the chicken with the roasted rooted roast root vegetables, oh my gosh, it it was just insanely wonderful. We had a taste of Eden's heirloom blend ice cider that was like after the meal. And then we finished the meal with ice cream with some of the secret cider makers, Calvados, dipped on to that. Oh, Lord. It was something. Um, mm. So, of course, I'm doing this again next year. And uh, if you want to go on that tour, you should start contacting me now. I'm going to be kind of planning it a little bit differently. I might even have it be an overnight this time because let me tell you, that region of the world is so darn beautiful and we could just uh, sit around the fire and enjoy cider all night. <laughs> Maybe it's a sleepover that's never a sleepover. Oh, anyways, uh, stay tuned for that. I I have the bug in me and I just so enjoy sharing my passion for cider with folks who have an equal passion for cider or not necessarily everybody on the trip were just folks who just want to drink cider and there's nothing better than that and then delve into food mm, yum yum so that was on thursday and then on friday it was a kickoff into franklin county cider days give me cider from cider so golden and sweet in a can or a bottle it's always a treat or straight from the tap at the bar That was a little taste of the Cider Pub Sing. What a delightful time it takes place on Friday night. If you're coming to Cider Days next year, you got to go to it. It is absolutely just music to my ears when you keep on hearing cider and apple song one after another with some magnificent singers. You get to join along or you could just sit in the back and keep on doing a little bit of here. You want to try that? I had a little keg of my cider and a bunch of bottles and folks are coming in all night long just sharing cider. It was fantastic. The entire weekend was fantastic. Earlier that day, I was out at Pine Hill Orchard getting some cider for uh, my barrel, which I am now swelling. It's sitting outside in the rain, poured a bunch of water in there, and it's just like, oh, every little seam, it was just squirting out water. And about 24 hours later, it's uh, seeming to be swollen up enough. So fingers crossed on that. I'll get the cider in soon. But while I was there, I met someone from California by the name of Brandon. You could follow him on uh, Instagram at The Ferment Life. Really nice guy. He was checking out Cider Days, I think, for the first time. 
And then it just started. It was just one after another meeting you, the listeners out there from Ciderville, coming to my spot of Ciderville. You filled my heart up. I cannot, I cannot tell you what an honor it was to meet everyone who took the time, who it wasn't shy and said, hi, Rhea, and put out your hand and shook my hand. I mean, most of the time you'd think, oh, absolute strangers, you know, a little nervous, but each person I met, I I was just so proud of Ciderville. I'm just so darn proud of you folks. You're just amazing people who are really a pleasure, pleasure to have in in the world. So thank you so much. Um, Then there's also a particular scene that happened at the cider salon that just blew me out of the water. That was with Roland and Courtney and Matt and Catherine. Uh, they recognized my voice and it was a mini love fest. Uh, I took a, a photo with them. I'm going to be putting that up on the show notes to this here episode 153. One, one amazing time after another, we had bucks of rain coming down, swirling wind. And then on Sunday, the skies cleared. I got to go out to New Salem, orchards, or New Salem preserves that I always talk about, walking out in the orchard and sharing my passion with uh, Scott from Seattle Cider Company, Christine from Ballman Cider on Oregon, Pat from Wrangletown in Humboldt, California, uh, Elizabeth Ryan, you got to come back, girl, because I'm going to get you out into that orchard and you got to walk around it. Just a humdinger of a time, I'll tell you. Um, first time ever, they are now serving fermented cider from that orchard. So it was a love fest. Just wait until the 25th year. Uh, wow. Uh, also got to see the folks from the Northmen, Josh, Ambrosia, and Brian. Oh, I could just keep on going down the list of people. It was just nonstop cider. And the, here's the other thing that you should know about it that was really, I think, a key. And this is something that we've noticed over the years, I got to go for the first time ever after 24 years, go to uh, Paul Carenti and um, uh, Charlie Chowski and Nathan was there, the cider maker of the year, Nathan, uh, going over home cider makers product that they would bring in and we'd all taste. And wouldn't you know it, a lot of those products coming in were wild for men. Now that, my friends, is just music to my ears. That was a definite theme there. We did not see at the salon that many hopped ciders. In fact, I didn't taste one. Isn't that interesting? Um, but a lot of scrumped apples, people just working their their butts off to try to get that perfect heritage apple, that perfect kind of pippin out there, put it in the bottle and let the wild yeast go. It was, it, it's where I have been hoping it would go for a while. So not that the other ciders aren't good, mind you. I do, I'm do. i kind of a little bit partial, though, to just seeing where the apple will take you as it is and stands alone. Wow, that was pretty neat. Uh, also got to see Ron from the Spoke and Spy. I have a beautiful picture of he and his wife up there. He's worked long and tiredly, tight, tirelessly writing about cider. You can follow him on all the social media channels under Drink Cider. Great guy. He's really been toting cider for a long time. And uh, I have a beautiful, beautiful photo of him. And I had some of his cider and it was really good. So big tip of the glass there. When I come back, I want to introduce you to my my friends in the Cider House, uh, and, uh, and we'll keep on rolling forward. Up in the morning before the sun, don't get on home till the day is done. I think that's heavy and my shoulders sore, but I'll be back tomorrow with a great sun. I know, I know you want to hear that whole song. Uh, rest assured, I'll get another recording out. I'm actually going to a harvest party this weekend where I know there's going to be some more singing. I'll see what I could do for you. But in the meanwhile, I just want to say thank you to Who Cider You're On, which is his social media uh, brand, right, out there. Who Cider You're On, you want to follow him on Instagram for sure. I was at Franklin County Saturdays. After we gave a hug, he says, Rhea, I have something for you. And out comes, well, 
Let me introduce you first to Quincy Quince. <coughs> hey, how you doing? And Muggsy Medlar. Sure good to be here. They hitched a ride with Husaidi Iran, and they've been hanging out with me throughout Saturdays. I might be posting some photos as we go along. Uh, yeah, they'll be here for as long as they can. And, you know, when the palms go, the palms roll. But I'm really, really happy to have them with me in the Cider House right now. You guys are the best. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ria. Yeah, this is great. So we're going to just keep on moving forward here. Next up is going to be this chat with Claude Jacquelet talking about the journey to Kazakhstan. This presentation was recorded at Franklin County Saturdays 2018. On the schedule, the actual name of the presentation is Central Asia, Our Travels to the Birthplace of Apples. But in truth, it seems for Claude, the real reason to go there was to see one apple tree in particular, and that was the world's largest and oldest apple tree. So you'll get to hear him talk a bit about that. But I want to give you a little bit of a heads up. Claude was standing off stage and also showing a PowerPoint at the same time. I think I've edited it enough that despite the fact that you cannot visually see the PowerPoint, he is descriptive enough that you could follow along. And I think it's really worth it because, wow, Kazakhstan, are you kidding me? The birthplace of the apple. So much there and so much more that we're going to be learning, I'm sure, as time rolls forward. He was also wearing a traditional cap, which is like a baseball cap. Uh, it was white. It looked like it was made out of leather. And it had this kind of swirly script on it, which is, I believe, different symbolism that is used in both their weavings. He had some photos of weavings. And it was also on his jacket, which looked much like a, a smoke jacket, like from days gone by. It had a way to attach it, which was with um, like a robe, right, with a tie. Blue with white trim, like a dark, deep navy blue with white trim and, and white script throughout. When I say script, I'm, I'm meaning like symbolism. So that's what he wore. It was really cool to see him up there, and he looked quite cozy. But he was also holding the microphone close to his chest, so you're getting a little bit of background noise. Noise that there's nothing I could do about it, but the the conversation and whenever you, ever you get a chance to speak with Claude, it's worthwhile. I still want to roll with this, so we're gonna shoot it out to you now. Take this journey to Kazakhstan and hear his tales there. And a little bit of an alert: there is a movie coming out on this particular journey. So I don't know when, sometime next year, you could be sure as soon as I know, I will be letting you know. So in the meanwhile, let's grab a glass and join this amazing adventure to Kazakhstan with Claude Jacquelet. Well, thank you, Al. So yes, this was a trip that I made in August last year. And it's a great chance, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, Kazakhstan is like the dream place of all Apple geeks. So most of the people who make cider or are interested in cider are also Apple geeks. So um, I never thought I would go there, you know, it's just that it happened like that. Uh, well, I had the sort of feeling I might be going because my wife is from Kazakhstan, so we knew we would go probably once, but it's one thing to go to Kazakhstan, visit your wife's family and friends, but it doesn't mean you're going to have access to the wild apple forest, so that's a completely other thing. 
And so I had the chance to do both. So first of all, uh, we can try and locate this place. So we're talking about the Tian Shan Mountains, which are a range of mountains. The Himalaya is here. So the Himalaya comes here and is sort of a continuation of the Himalaya. It's between China and Kazakhstan, and a lot of it is on Kyrgyzstan here. So uh, Afghanistan is here, Russia, Mongolia to locate this. In. So this is really what we call Central Asia. And uh, there's a, uh, I don't know, classical music. There's a piece by Borodin on, in the steppes of Central Asia. So that's exactly what we're going to see a little later. Uh, but before we can talk about the wild apple forest, I need to say a word about Mr. Aymak Jangaliev, which was a Kazakh scientist uh, who has uh, spent his whole lifetime for the study and for the protection of the wild apple forest. He has published a lot of things, mostly in Russian, but some of it has been translated and published in, the, in a very serious uh, scientific uh, magazine or uh, Arctic, uh, Acta Articul, uh, Articul or something like that. Anyway, there is a whole volume on uh, Jangaliev's writing about the wild uh, forests in Kazakhstan. He lived to 96 years old, uh, died in 2009, and he was still active during his 90s. You know, he never retired. Uh, this man was the host of the four expeditions that were made by the scientists from Cornell and English scientists also that went during the 90s. He was their guide. Um, he has selected a number of uh, varieties from the wild trees, and so he's founded uh, a study orchard where they have uh, propagated those uh, selections. So he's done a lot, a lot of work on those, and he's a very important man. He's, and during the Soviet era, there, was, there has been a lot of deforestation also, so he, he has worked a lot to protect and uh, keep the deforestation to a minimum uh, in those areas. But uh, we'll see places that have been deforested. They're full of small apple trees like that now, so the apple trees coming back. So now, about our trip. The organizers of this trip were these two people here. Alexander Thomas is an Englishman whose mother is of French origin. And he married uh, Aishan, which is a Kazakh woman. Uh, he was a journalist, uh, and he was working on aviation, uh, an article on aviation. He was going to Kazakhstan to interview the head of the Kazakh national airline, Air Astana, and he met Aishan on the plane and ended up with a marriage, and he moved to Kazakhstan. But he was already interested by wine because of his mother's family and ins his insider because he was British. So when he moved to Kazakhstan, he, he started thinking about using those wild apples to make cider. So he's now starting a cidery in Almaty. And, um, Part of his cider project uh, was to make a film, a documentary film, with the relation of the wild apples to the cider making. And for this, he, oh, that's a story. OK, that's what I'm saying. He invited four, what I call the cider men, uh, to come and to interact in the film. So these are. Uh, Andrew Lee, which is uh, probably one of the most known scientists in cider uh, on the world at the moment. 
Uh, he's worked a lot in the Long Ashton in England, in the Long Ashton Research Station. Uh, there was Ryan Burke, who's the head cider maker at Angry Orchard. He happens to be a good friend of Alex, so Alex invited him. And there's Peter Mitchell, uh, who's uh, probably the best known trainer for s commercial cider makers. He has a Cider in Perry Academy, which has given training sessions uh, in the UK and in North America also. And I'd say at least three quarters of commercial cider makers in the US have had this training. And actually it was fun because uh, Ryan Burke, uh, head cider maker of the largest cidery, uh, cider producer in the States, uh, he, he was saying when he hires a new employee for Angry Orchards, he asked the new employee to do three things. To read Andrew Lee's book, to read my book, and to follow Peter Mitchell's training session. <laughs> and there we were, the three of us, you know, reunited in Kazakhstan uh, to, because of Alex's dream of making cider in a film in Kazakhstan. It was, it was fun. So that was the film crew, those two guys. Uh, the film crew, so these are two guys who work a lot uh, for the BBC, so they make a lot of documentary. So we had uh, Matt on the camera and Mark on the sound taking. And our interpreters, naturally no, nobody speaks English over there. Uh, there are two, English, two languages that are spoken, the Kazakh and the uh, Russian language. So Aishan, which is Alex's wife, and Banu, who is my own wife, who act as interpreters, and they were very, very useful, both of them. Okay, so our first day, uh, by the way, Almaty is the largest city in Kazakhstan. Uh, Almaty is a new name, it was renamed rather recently. Before that, the name was Alma Ata. And the word Alma in Kazakh is apple, and Ata is granddad. So Alma Ata is the granddad of the apple. Um, and actually, it was funny because Banu's daughter was always calling her grandfather Atashka, which is diminutive of uh, Atta. So this is a national park here in the mountain, Ili Alato National Park. So the first location we went was in this area here, about an hour and a half from Almaty. Um, so that was quite close. That was a day trip. Uh, we went out in the morning and we visited two locations. But we started seeing uh, apple trees on the road going there. And that was one. And it was fun because we'll see a lot of horses. The Kazakh people are horse lovers. Uh, it's a nomad people, and horse is really the most important animal in Kazakhstan. There are lots of horses. And those horses happen to be under the apple tree. Uh, I'm not too sure they were looking for the shade or for the windfalls, or maybe for both but they really gathered there. And then we arrive at the park, and if you read Russian, you'll see that this post was saying that it was forbidden to enter. But uh, so that was part of the work that they did for the film, it was to secure permits. So that's why I was saying that even if you go as a tourist to Kazakhstan, it's not obvious that you'll have access to the sites where the uh, wild apple forests are. Uh, I like this guy on your left uh, with his really uh, typical Soviet area cap. Um, he was a very nice man. He was, so he was the uh, responsible for the sector of the park and the other guy was a forest worker. So we started our journey. Our little group arrived to this nice shack 
we can see there are uh, boxes for the apples on the top, all dismantled. And we started our walk. So it's, it's like that most of the time. It's bush, really bush, inextricable jungle with apples everywhere. Um, and this was an off year last year. There weren't many apples, but there still was enough. Uh, lots of bees also. You see on the left pictures, uh, we were served a lot of uh, very nice honey. Uh, that was from the bloom of uh, apple. Really, really great honey that there was there. A few other trees that were not apples. This one was uh, uh, probably a sort of hawthorn with small, uh, small red fruits. And so there was quite a bit of those. And another interesting plant that there was here growing wild is uh, cannabis sativa. <laughs> there, there was quite a bit of that growing wild. And uh, so it was just anecdotal like that. So there was a trail that we actually followed, and uh, we just climbed up to, uh, on the mountainside through that trail, and there were apple trees everywhere. So those are all apple trees. Uh, this is interesting because the, the ground floor is all clear there, and that's because of the horse. And normally, it's all bush everywhere. But where the horses go, they just tap on the ground and nothing grows. So that was the, the path of the horses. And turkeys were there also. They seemed to enjoy very much the windfalls. And they were just uh, going wild. We went at a second location. And here it was a little more inviting. It's written in English, welcome to the Yalato State Park. <clears throat> so that, that part of the park was more uh, open to visitors. You see, really see the structure of the tree, uh, untouched tree, never trimmed, uh, growing natural. Uh, we see it well there. So here we're tasting, we tasted a lot of apples, naturally. And every time we would taste one and say, well, would that be good in cider? Uh, is it, does it have tannin? What's the acidity like? And discussion all the time between ourselves. And naturally, everything we did was shot by the film crew, you know, and all the conversations also. So uh, they were always filming us and following or in front of us and uh, all. But there was no scenario, really. We were just doing our things and they were picking, they probably shot, uh, I think, 50 hours of uh, footage. And then they're going to edit all of this and make a film that should come out during the winter. But I have the trailer. We can look at the trailer after. So that was a nice uh, bittersweet uh, apple that we found that Peter had on this one. And you see on the left picture, you know, the, the trail that was really always apple trees uh, covering. Well, these trees were quite high, as you can see also, no, no small trees. And this path on the left picture, the, the guide was telling us that on an on year, it's all covered with apples with sort of thickness like that. It's almost impossible to walk because it's like walking on, on rollers, you know. So uh, this year, there were a few, but really nothing compared to a big, heavy, heavy here. And that's another encounter that we had. This, this was actually quite frightening because we were leisurely walking the path, and then we hear some noise. What's that? And then the horses arrived, you know, running towards us. Oh, shit. <laughs> so we had to sort of hide behind trees so, because they, they were really, but they were surprised also. So, so they sort of stopped before getting to the group, but 
it was a bit frightening. And I was able to make this shot, which I think is quite nice. And the second day of the trip is where really we drove through the steppe. So that was, if you look at the first day we were here. So this was a much longer uh, route. You can see this is an artificial reservoir which serves as a water supply for the city. So the first picture we'll see is a stop we did here and we see the reservoir. And after that there will be a few pictures through, this, through the road, seeing the steps. And we ended up in the evening in Sarkhan. So that was about five hour drive. So the whole day was taken driving that road. And Sarkhan is a very small town uh, which has kept this Soviet era sort of uh, atmosphere. You know. But uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. So that's a picture of the reservoir. Uh, you can see uh, on the bottom a yurt, which is a traditional tent of the nomad people in Kazakhstan. Uh, so it's sort of a round tent, similar to those the Mongol people have, or a lot of people in those areas have this sort of tent. These are the steps. And you can see the, the mountains in the back, or the Tian Shan, and on the other side of the mountain, it was China. So this is really a, a big range of mountains, uh, really high, and, uh, but the apple forests are, are really sort of at the base of those mountains. But there are others that are on China side, uh, but those are not accessible. And I was told that actually on the China side, uh, the species of Malusi Virsi is purer, more uh, authentic, and that on the uh, Kazakh side, it's more or less uh, hybridized a little more with some uh, domestica or other species. Actually, it's not clear if domestica is really a species. Uh, some people now say that it's really a sub uh, a part of Siversi with uh, more limited uh, genes than the whole of uh, Siversi uh, species. So that was a fruit stand on the road. There were a lot of those. You know, people would just gather apples and melons and put that uh, on the side of the road and sell it. And uh, if we look at the apples from closer, uh, most of them had no names, you know. They were just sort of apples that they gathered. Uh, they have a few apple trees in the backyards. Uh, they go everywhere and, oh, that one is nice, we're going to pick them. And they gather that in a bucket and sell that. Uh, some were named, I think this one here is probably an Aporta, which is uh, similar to the Alexander apple, which is known here, which has been imported in North America. And a few of them were named varieties, but uh, most of them, no. So they could be hybrids between Siversi and Domestica or seeds that grew and uh, so on. They all seem quite large. Well, some of them are quite small, <laughs> but uh, they did select the larger one to sell, naturally. Uh, like uh, it's natural human way of doing things. And actually, there are some theories that say that the, uh, the bear was the main uh, action in selecting the wild apples. And the bear naturally selected or ate the ones that, had, uh, that were bigger and were sweeter. And by eating those apples, he spreaded the pips 
So, though, so he made a natural selection from the wild population of apple trees that selected the nicest and the biggest uh, fruit to be propagated through by eating by the bears. So the bear is considered as, uh, an important factor in the, the evolution of the wild apple. And there's no spray, they don't spray. I guess it's in the way of growing them, I don't know, but yeah, there are some that have blemishes, but I can easily uh, select the nice ones and make the buckets of blemish, uh, and the rest I make cider with them. So. It's great. When you make cider, you just need about 10% of nice fruit for eating, and the rest goes to the press. So you don't need to, don't need to spray. So we visit two locations in that area. So we, we were based, we spent the night in Sarkand, and then we drove to Lipsinsk, which was our first stop. We spent the morning there visited some sites there. And in the afternoon, we went to Topolevka, where there's a camp, and we slept at that camp. On our way to Lepsinsk, and these are the areas that were deforested uh, to leave places for raising cattle or for agriculture. But now we see all of those are small apple trees that are coming back. So the apple tree is sort of regaining its rights on its old land, you know. So that's really fascinating to see this. So that was the, we see the village of Lepsinx there, which is a very small village. There used to be a wine factory there in the Soviet area, but it closed down. So there's no electricity, naturally, in those camps, so they do everything very uh, basic, uh, wood, uh, wood-fired uh, cooking, and uh, there was this post uh, showing the, the path, the trail that could be followed to, uh, in the park. But the trail wasn't that easy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, part of it could be made in those uh, jeeps, but all those trees there are apple or wild apple trees. And part of it was made uh, horseback riding. Uh, some other part, uh, some other people chose to walk, but uh, depend. And the yeah, that was the sort of the peak, uh, the main thing we wanted to see when we were there is this apple tree, which is the largest recorded apple tree on the planet. Uh, so the trunk diameter, one meter, so uh, that's uh, three feet and something just you, you can see the trunk here, besides my wife. Uh, and it's really healthy, no rot, no nothing. The tree's estimated age is about 300 years. Uh, really a huge, a huge specimen. Uh, the park people said that they think there are probably bigger ones in remote areas of the forest, but it's not accessible, so they can't uh, they can't be sure, but that one has been measured and uh, they want to put it in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> this place, it's really inextricable, you know, you, you just can't go. Uh, but so I think by flying, they spotted the f place here and there where they, they saw big ones, but they couldn't measure it like they did for this one. This one? It's estimated 300 years, but it's an estimation. The landscape was really nice. Mountain formations were all riddled and uh, really beautiful. Here, it was interesting because it was not like a forest, you know. It's sort of uh, scattered trees, which were apple trees, 
but not dense like in other locations where we've seen. Once again, that was a dead tree, but uh, really more scattered. And that, was, that raised an interesting discussion among the cider people, uh, because that was wild hops growing on an apple tree. And uh, naturally, uh, two of us, Andrew Lee and myself, are quite purists in our cider making uh, feeling or way we do it. So we're not really for hop cider, but Peter Mitchell and Ryan Burke are more open-minded to all of those things. <laughs> so it did raise a discussion if hops grow wild in apple trees, isn't it natural that we brew them together or ferment them and add hops to the cider? But this was going on for a little while. And then the park people told us that, uh, well, the hops are not natural there. They've been brought by men. So it sort of closed the discussion. <laughs> But it was interesting. Uh, here we see that in some location there were other trees than apple trees. Uh, so in some locations, really, it was mainly apple trees. It was a dominant species. Other locations, well, it's more of a mixed, uh, mixed forest. So again, the landscape. apple trees. So this was more dense, you know, the walking through there is really not easy. And picking the apples is not an easy task either. Well, that was Ryan that was testing one here. So some, uh, some of the apples, uh, all sizes, but those that we found that were more like a bit of sweet uh, flavor were usually smaller. Uh, the larger fruits that we found were more uh, like a table fruit, like dessert fruit. That was Andrew Lee testing an apple again. And this is a table of the lunch that we had. So everywhere we were prepared some traditional uh, Kazakh uh, food. And um, so that was very pleasant. And these are the women that had prepared the lunch. Uh, so the, actually, the second the one that's in a camouflage uh, dressing is Russian. Uh, th that's my wife who told me that because I wouldn't recognize them. But that one is Russian and the th four others are pure Kazakh. So by the, the face uh, type, you can recognize them. So Russians and Kazakh people are sort of intermixed in Kazakhstan. There's a lot of Russian people who went there during the Soviet era and stayed there after the breakup of Soviet Union. <coughs> so that was another interesting encounter. So here in America, we had cowboys. So this is really a horse boy. So he's leading a herd of horses. And when we met him, the film people uh, went to negotiate with him a little bit, so he made a show with his horses. Uh, guiding them with his long stick there, he just uh, guides them. And so he had them turn around a few times so that the film crew could film this. So that was really fun. And again, those little trees growing everywhere are all apple trees. So that are coming back uh, to re repopulate this area. So that was, by the end of the day, the light was so nice. Um, 
the, the colors don't come out as well on this screen, but it's really the, the colors of that picture are really beautiful. And this is really typical of the area. Those ribbed ribs in the mountains, and uh, this is where the apple trees forest really, really are. So in general, the uh, the trees are at an altitude of uh, between three to four thousand feet altitude. That's where the most uh, most trees grow. And here we arrive at the camp. So you see there the man with his traditional costume. So uh, with the hat, so I have a hat like that also. <laughs> uh, that was given to me by my wife's family when we visited. And uh, this dress is a long dress you know, that goes down, down to the feet. So I thought of bringing that, but I thought it was a bit much. So <laughs> I settled with the smaller jacket. And the woman's costume is really nice also. And she was playing the, I think it's a, a dumba or something like that, the name of the instrument. It's just two strings. And uh, she was singing on it. It was really nice. So this was a yacht. So the man on your left is Professor Isin. So he's been a student of Jean Galief. Uh, and he's now he has taken over the the work that Jean Galief had been doing on the protection and the study of the wild apple forests. So the the following day, I think it's the next slide. No. No. Okay. Uh, I'll get back to. We'll talk about him a little later. So that was the banquet inside the yurt. So all of these here, these uh, like carpets or tapestry, it's all traditional uh, Kazakh uh, drawings that you see there. And you see some more of it here with the wooden um, a stencil they use to serve the food. And uh, so it's always very richly decorated like that. So the nomad people, uh, when they set up their yurts, they had all their carpets and everything, and they would then carry that to another location and put that up. But always carpets on the floor, on the walls, and a lot of decoration like that. And that was a traditional meal, which is a bech barmak, um, something that I have the chance of having my wife cooking for me once in a while, about twice a year. <laughs> but most of the people uh, hadn't had it before. So it's mostly a sheep that is uh, boiled and served on uh, white pasta, a bit like lasagna pasta, but it's always handmade pasta and um, very traditional. Actually, when we were all in my wife's family, uh, spent three nights there, we were invited in three different locations and had Bishparmak the three nights. <laughs> and I think one lunch also. So every time there is some special people invited, this is the, uh, the meal that is served. You can see some of the wild apples on the, on the right, on the top, and the bottle of vodka, Coca-Cola, wild apples, and bottled water. Uh, Coca-Cola was quite present. What can I say? Uh, and the other tradition is to serve the head of the sheep to the most, um, uh, let's say, honorable guest. So it was Andrew Lee who got it as the most eminent scientist in our group and also the eldest uh, guest. 
So he was uh, served the head of the sheep. He didn't know really what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> he had to receive the instruction. But uh, the tradition <coughs> is to cut the ears and give the ears to the children. And then um, other parts, the, well, people there, no. So, and you can notice there were <coughs> a few bottles of our cider there. Bottle you see there is uh, Peter Mitchell's cider. I had brought a few, and Andrew had brought a few. We, were, we had a few bottles of Angry Orchards also. And that's how they cooked it. So this was like a very large wok, uh, circular, on the fire. And essentially, they put the whole uh, sheep on in there. It was boiled for a whole day. And uh, yeah. And that's how they make the tea. Uh, it's like a samovar. But homemade samovar, they make a little fire on this milk jug, and they boil the water like that. OK, they do have a few health problems with the forest. There are some insects. Uh, and they do notice that the forest in some areas do not regenerate itself as much as it does. So there's a lack of young apple trees. So he was telling us about the, the research they are doing. Uh, this is part of wild trees, but they have cleared under to see if clearing helps or not for the health of the trees. Because otherwise, it's really inextricable. You know, it's uh, really dense, uh, very dense, uh, very hard to walk around the trees. We had the last day a visit to uh, the orchard that Jean Garlief had founded near Almaty. So we were able to speak with a scientist that take care of that uh, experimental orchard. The woman on the right, uh, Gauha, was a very nice woman who had been put in, who was in charge of this uh, lab. And she has been selected by Jean Garlief himself to take over to continue his work. So that was the, uh, the orchard. So the selections of Jean Galief have been grafted on semi-dwarf uh, semi rootstocks and uh, planted in a standard orchard environment for observation. And we can see here, this is a cider section. So it's in Cyrillic, but you can see this is cider here. C, there's a delta, that's for the D. And the P is, in Cyrillic, is the R. So uh, that was the cider section. So he, he made some of his selection for cider, others for fresh eating, others for transformation, juice, and everything. And then we were in the institute so uh, that woman on the right was the uh, general director of the institute. And this was in the lab of Gao Ha. And they did things quite seriously. All of those bottles were juice from each of the selection. And uh, they pasteurized it. On, and on each of the label, it was written the amount of sugar, the amount of acid, the amount of tannin. And they pasteurized that and had us uh, taste them and uh, trying to have our opinion on the value of those different juices. And you see the apples there. So those are the apples. And I did bring a few of those apples in my pocket. <laughs> I did say it at the border. I said, yes, I have a few apples, no problem. I didn't tell the guy, oh, they were wild apples from Kazakhstan. No, they were apples. No problem. Gauha had written on the apples that I brought back, uh, she had written the, the selection number there. 
So I have some record of what they are. So that's one of the apple that I brought back. And naturally, I couldn't prevent from doing something with the seed. So, and it turned out, to my surprise, to be a red leaf, Malus Siversi. So, possibly, I don't know how it happened, because the, the fruit that gave the seed was not a red flesh fruit, but the seedling happened to be a red leaf seedling. So we'll see a few in a few years what that will do. that is just so fascinating, isn't it? Kazakhstan. Wow. An other side of the world from my spot of Ciderville for sure. Uh, Although I will tell you that quite a few folks have been asking me if I'm going to be doing a cider tour to Kazakhstan. And don't you know, I am, uh, what do you say, kind of feeling that out. It's rather involved, but again, I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted. It sure would be quite an experience. And uh, now that we're in a global world, things like that could happen. So stay tuned. And I have one last thing to say this week, which is a big tip of the glass to Erica, who just became a patron of Cider Chat. She came in to the Patreon. Again, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a website that helps content providers like myself keep on doing our artwork. And in this case, my art is this podcast to bring it to you each week. And Erica became a patron at at the dollar and eight cent level. Isn't this getting interesting, Ciderville? You're having some fun out there. You're making me crack up. I love it. You're kind of playing like uh, our friend out in Portugal does, right? (laughs) I love it. A dollar and eight cents. That is so fun and wiggy. I love it. I love it. Love it. And uh, I know Erica, she is an amazing home cider maker in her own right. I don't know where she gets all the energy, but she took enough time to sign up to Patreon. You can too. It means a lot to, to me to be able to keep on keeping on getting this podcast out to you every single week at 150 episodes. Thank you, Erica. I can't wait to raise a glass with you and say cheers, hopefully sooner than later. I'm going to start rolling out of here myself and get back to that barrel that's out in the yard and see if it's ready to receive some cider. I'll keep you tuned and probably be posting a little video of some of that up on the Cider Chat YouTube channel. In the meanwhile, this is Rio Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Yeah.